Okay, everyone, so we'll go ahead and get started. If we have some more people join us, um, we might see some more windows pop up here, but we're just gonna do, Ashley and I are gonna be doing a quick overview of uh, poster presentations. And I'm just gonna do a quick run through of um, resources available from the libraries, more specifically with research. And Ashley's gonna dig in deeper with a lot of um, the steps and requirements involved with putting together and constructing a poster presentation. And you guys can feel free to drop questions in the chat. It'll they'll probably be addressed a little bit further on um, closer to the end of the presentation. But definitely, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we will in the future have recordings available or tutorial videos on this topic as well on the um, CSU Pueblo Library YouTube channel. So you'll see more come out. Um, so to get started, um, Ashley, do you mind popping up to the next screen? Or slide, thank you. Um, so really quick, I'm just gonna touch on to make sure everybody knows what resources are available to them. Um, if you are still endeavoring to collect information to support your um, the research that you're conducting for your poster presentation, um, there is one-on-one -on -one research assistance through the library. I'm one of the librarians, so you can reach out to me. I'm Joelle um, and, or Betsy or our new librarian, Beth, and either of us can assist you with providing um, or helping you kind of track down resources. We also have an online chat um, and I'll drop the library homepage just in case and the our little chat box as well. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have visited this webpage at this point. Um, also, just make sure uh, everybody's aware of Super Search is like our single search platform for finding books through the library, as well as uh, can provide a pretty reliable list of articles and other related resources that may be pertinent to your research, and that can be found on the library's homepage. And then also, just um, if you're wanting to get into more discipline or subject specific research, I definitely recommend checking out our database A to Z list. Um, I'm dropping that in the chat as well. And you can search, um, we have over 400 databases, but you can look at the databases specific to your research. So I kind of have a demo there of some of the databases that are more discipline specific. Um, so if you're having any issues with finding articles related to your topic, you can um, open up any of these databases and start accessing resources through that as in addition to super search. And then there's also research guides, which the databases list and the research guides, um, subject specific research guides can be found uh, on the library homepage. And there is actually a poster presentation guide. And Ashley's probably gonna touch on that as well, um, that it covers a lot of the information that um, will be included today. So go in, if you go into, and I dropped it in the chat, the guides.library.csupolo.edu. There's a specific guide for, that's just a general guide for um, poster presentations as well, just to kind of help serve as a resource for you all. And that's all I have to share, but Ashley's gonna dig a little bit deeper into specifics about poster present, creating poster presentations. So thank you. Yeah, and I actually have the link, I think to the poster, um, the poster lib guide, so I'll post that in the chat for you too, just in case. Now let me scroll back up here. Okay. Okay, great. So basically, um, we just want to go over some of the elements to get you started with the basics of designing your poster um, as we're moving through this process of creating it to printing it. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm the educational technologist for CSU Pueblo. So I manage um, a lot of the different educational technology pieces, this being one of them laying out this information um, for students who need it for their posters. Um, I like designing posters. I think it's kind of a fun creative process, um, but it can be a little overwhelming. So having those standardized pieces, so you know how to at least get started um, and have a sort of some standards to follow as you're moving along can be helpful. So we'll start with creating it because we need to make sure 
the poster is the right size, um, depending on what platform you're using. We'll talk about some content layout elements, some design elements, and then the final steps you'll need to take to um, save your document and then um, what you need to do to work on getting it printed. Okay, so let's start with creating your poster. Um, for our purposes here today, I'm gonna focus on um, some instructions for using PowerPoint and Google Slides, but most of the designing elements are gonna focus in PowerPoint. If you're using something other than one of these uh, two software applications, um, We'll talk about how you can get some more support on using something different. Um, that'll be through the Innovation Lab, which is on the second floor of the library. So I'll go into that in more detail closer to the end. So you have some um, context for where you can go to get more support uh, if what we're covering here is not necessarily what you're using to create your poster this time around. Okay. First step is to make sure that your poster is the right size. The default sizes when you open a new PowerPoint file or Google slide is not what is going to be relevant for um, your poster. So these are just some instructions for how to find where to change the sizing. Um, I know that the STEM Research Symposium document that we have says that the posters cannot exceed 52 inches in width slash length by 42 inches in height or tall. Um, for our purposes, we're gonna size them so that they're 50 by 40 inches uh, is what you're gonna wanna shoot for. That way, um, when you go to print, they're not gonna run off and there's enough space built in there so that you don't have any issues with that. But we do need to make sure that we change the size in whichever system we're using so that um, when you're formatting the content on your slide, that it matches, um, that it, you don't have an issue when you go to print it. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. We'll talk about uh, it more in depth here. But just for your reference, this is where you go to find that information on changing um, the width and height and also the orientation. So additionally, for our purposes, um, some symposiums will have you do your posters in portrait, but we're focusing on landscape. Okay, and it's gonna move through in a little more detail. This slide has a lot of boxes, but just so you have a more in-depth walkthrough, at the top in PowerPoint, you're gonna go through design at the top and then next to the various designs of slides you have, uh, there's slide size, and then you have to go to custom, which will pop open this separate box. And from there, you'll select custom from this drop-down menu, and then you can enter in your width and height. Keep it on the landscape. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's good to start with resizing your slide before you create any content within it, because you might run into issues where you're going to have to figure out whether you want to scale to fit or whether you want to crop the information to fit in the poster. So it's just easier to start with sizing it correctly. Then you don't have to worry about adjusting sizing of anything later because you forgot to do it at the beginning. So just keep that in mind that it'll mess with all of the content in your poster if you don't start with this step. Okay, and then hitting okay will change the size of your poster for you. And that's how it works in PowerPoint. So here's how it would work in Google Slides, just real quick. It's a little different. You'd have to go under file when you're in your presentation. And then down here at the bottom is a page setup, which opens this box. And from this drop down menu, you hit custom, and then you're 50 by 40. Apply, and then it'll resize your poster for you to the correct size. Okay, moving on to content layout. Um, it seems to me that there's uh, there can be some variability in the content layout of your posters, but um, there's a few different thing guidelines you can follow so that it's a little clearer to you. Um, a couple of things we just generally want to cover are things like margins, the use of blank space within your poster so that it doesn't look too crowded, which makes it more difficult to read, and then how you want to lay out your sections and elements. Um, a lot of the concepts we talk about when we talk about posters and poster presentations has to do with the readability of your poster, because that's the goal of your, that's the purpose of your poster is for people to be able to read it. So um, 
there's some certain standards and guidelines we can follow to make sure that your poster is easier to read, that more people come to visit it because they're interested in it, because it, it looks easy to read. Um, and so, yeah, let's go into the content here. So here I've just pulled an example. Um, if you do any Google searching of poster presentations, you can find a lot of stuff. In the LibGuide that's on the CSU Pueblo Library site, um, there's some links to like a wide variety of sites where you can see some other poster templates, get some inspiration. But do be careful with the posters that you pull inspiration from and just make sure they're following some of the guidelines that we're gonna talk about here. So the first thing is the margins and the blank space. This poster is pretty good. I think what actually makes this poster kind of difficult to read is the fact that it looks like they bolded all of their font, um, which isn't necessarily something you want to do with the body of your, of your sections. I think that's what's making this look a little more crowded than it would. So we don't have a lot of space between the separate columns of content, and there's not a lot of space at the edges of the poster either. Um, and so that just makes it look a little crowded. Also, they do have a, a lot of visual elements that have color. So that is also um, makes it a little bit more difficult to read as or can make it a little more difficult to read. All in all, this is a good poster, but if we want to look at it for margins and blank space, there's not a lot of, of blank space or margin room here. Um, so yeah, not the best example. Um, for margins and blank space. Here's another example that I pulled from the same site. This one arguably has too much space between its columns. It could have maybe stretched it out a little longer so that there was more space being taken up here. They could have made their images bigger so that there was less, a little bit less blank space here. But this is um, a, makes it a little bit easier to read. Um, there's less visual elements taking up a lot of, um, there's less visual elements taking up um, too much of the space in the poster. <laughs> so just think about that when you're coming up with the elements that you have in your poster. Um, what visual elements such as images, graphs, and charts do you need to include? Um, what content do you need to include? How are you going to space that out so that it's, it's crowded enough, let's say. <laughs> There's enough content in there, but it's still easily read. So this one's a little bit better. Okay, as you're compiling your content for your posters, you may wanna look at um, the rulers and guides that either PowerPoint or Google Slides offers to you so that you can have a better idea of exactly how things are spaced. I think both of these applications now are pretty good about having things auto line up. So as you're moving elements around, there'll be like a little guide that'll show up just automatically. But just in case you want to see the actual ruler, the actual grid lines or guides, this is how you would find it um, in PowerPoint easy, you just go into the view tab at the top, and then there's options here to check mark them on and off, whatever items you want to show to help you guide the spacing in your poster. And then here's what it looks like in Google Slides. You have your view here at the top, and then just in there they have a check mark for the ruler, and then the option to show the guides. You can see I've selected it. So this is what the ruler looks like at the top. It looks kind of weird because the poster is large. <laughs> so the lines, if you zoomed in on your poster, maybe these would show better numbers, but that's why they look like lines. And then you have your guides. You can see the lines. And that's what it looks like in Google Slides. Okay, so like I mentioned, we have some flexibility, it seems like, in how exactly we want to lay out the content, where you want to put your images within the poster, um, how big you want your text sections to be. Generally, we don't want to have a wall of text, and so breaking up um, the elements with headers is one way to separate your content a little bit, make it look less crowded, like this one in particular, maybe not the best um, idea to have just the whole line of text. Um, but it is going to depend also on your poster, on your research, on whatever topic you're covering and what you have to convey about your topic. Um, so again, consider what text you need to include and what visual content you have and what pieces um, need to be included versus what you want to include. 
um, and start with what you need to include and get it on there first before you start laying out things um, one by one. It's better to get it all in there first, I think. Um, and so another thing you're gonna wanna stick with is having this column format. It just makes it, it goes back to that readability issue. Um, the columns make it easier to read because the eye naturally goes from top to bottom and then also left to right. So generally when you're looking at posters, that's a, that tends to be the route that they follow. And so that's a good practice to think about when you're creating your own posters to have it go um, top to bottom, left to right. But in terms of where you put your content sections, um, and your visual elements, it's a little flexible, depending on what you need to cover in your poster. Okay, so that's some ideas on content layout. I'm not gonna go into specifically what each section heading you need to have is. That might be something you wanna bring up with your faculty mentor to make sure um, you have all of the elements in there that they might think you need as well. So just a heads up on that. But let's talk about some design elements. So there's some standards for fonts, uh, text elements, the use of color, um, and visual elements such as graphs and pictures that we can talk about briefly. Um, this is going to be, I think, probably the biggest section of content, the visual elements in particular can take up a long time because there's a lot of variety in what you can do with the visual elements. So let's talk about, we're gonna start with um, fonts. So I've created just a draft poster here for us to look at, but it has all of the correct sizing, um, font sizing and font style um, and justification, it should, um, on here so that you can take a look at an example of what we're talking about. Generally for posters, it's good to stick to one to two font styles. So generally we'll have um, one font style for maybe the title and the figures and the section headings. And then we'll have another style for the body of the text. Too many font styles and because different font styles, the sizing is different. If you include too many different things, it'll make your poster less readable. So sticking to one to two font styles is a good practice to get into. And then we need to talk about sizing. So. Um, I did some background research to try to get a good standard. Um, it seems that nothing smaller than a 24 point font um, is recommended for posters. And that has to do with being able to see the, all the content from far enough away if it's posted, if your poster is on a, being displayed. Um, then we have differences for the headings. So the headings seem to be a little bit bigger so you can distinguish them from the rest of the text. Um, a good rule of thumb is 36 point font for the headings. And then the title should be, uh, I see some variations sometimes, but a hundred point will definitely get you where you need to be. It'll be big enough for it to be seen from far enough away. Generally for all of our text, we want it to be left justified. Sometimes we get some like centering of font um, or some other variations, but it, it really makes it more difficult to read. So general rule of thumb, and I've bolded it because that's really a rule we kind of want to try to follow with the body of our text is to keep it left justified. However, you can see the title is centered and the headings I see also centered a lot of times. So I think that's probably fine. But generally with the bodies of text, you want to keep that left justified. And then as you're composing the content for your poster, maybe think about how you can add in numbering or bullet points to help kind of break up that wall of text that can happen if you're just creating um, a bunch of paragraphs of content. Um, the bullet points and the numbers, the eyes are drawn to those because they're shorter, easier to read. So just think about maybe how you could incorporate the most important pieces of your poster um, and put them into the numbering or the bullet pointing. That's a good thing to think about. Okay, so these are just some examples of the fonts in the text that you can use. So generally for titles, headings, and figures, you wanna use a sans serif font, which means it doesn't have the little extra um, markings at the edges of the letters. So I've included some examples here for your reference. And then generally for the body text or paragraphs, um, people will use serif fonts. Um, and then here's some examples here. 
It's just something to keep in mind. I do also see some posters where um, all of it is using the sans serif font, which I think is probably fine too, because that's also easy to read. Generally, the, the understanding is that um, large chunks of text, they're easier to read if you use a serif font. So that's why there's the distinguishing factor between the two. Okay, let's talk about the use of color in our posters. Let me scroll down here a little bit. Okay, so this poster, you can see it's got a colored background, a full colored background, a large chunk of the poster has a blue color on it, which for our purposes is going to be a no no we don't want um, full color backgrounds for our posters. So don't put that in there because then when you go to get it approved to be printed, they're gonna say you can't, it has to have a white background. Um, that guidance is on the STEM symposium flyer that I saw. So just keep that in mind when you're designing your poster. We do need to have color elements in there because the eye will get drawn to those, but we can't do a full color background. So just keep that in mind. And then we need to think about what other color and visual elements we can add into our poster to catch a reader's attention. Um, it's important for visual interest, but we don't wanna overcrowd the poster too much. Um, one rule of thumb I saw in some research I did was to use color to emphasize something important. So here I've tried to minimize how much of this section is colored but um, using it to highlight the results section, which is usually a kind of a pretty important section within um, a scientific poster. Um, it usually has a lot of the visual elements that'll draw the eye specifically to that section. So that's why I've done it that way. Um, you do want to try to stick to not too many colors. <laughs> it's easy to be like, well, I'll do this graph and each bar is gonna be this color. And then this other graph, each bar is gonna be this color. Um, but you wanna stick to less colors, otherwise it's gonna make your poster less readable. And we, we're all about making your poster readable so that it catches people's attention, so people can be interested in the research that you've done and get through your poster, <laughs> all of the elements of your poster, okay? So good rule of thumb is three to five colors, or if you're using a design option in PowerPoint, because there are those options to select a design at the top that'll be applied to all of your slides, like if you're doing a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, sometimes those come with automated color schemes, so you can choose from there too, which can be kind of helpful. Um, so just something to think about. And then just be careful when you're choosing your colors that they're not too bright or that they might not print well. You want to be careful of colors like that. Um, for example, I've highlighted a box down here just because I want to draw, like let's say I wanted to draw readers to that attendance because attendance number because it's the highest. Um, but that yellow might be too bright for printing purposes. Um, and that's maybe something you can also check with your faculty mentor about, but just something for you to be aware of while you're creating your poster, um, not to choose colors that are, are overly bright and that may not print well. Okay, yes, let's talk about graphs. There's a lot of different options and I'm sure um, as, STEM people that you're having a lot of different types of graphs and charts. Um, I've seen chemical molecules, I've seen bar graphs, I've seen pie charts. Um, there's a lot of variation there. And we could talk about how to get <laughs> um, elements from an Excel or wherever else you may have your graphs and charts stored, um, but we're just gonna cover it briefly here. Um, you want to try and visual uh, simplify your visual elements. So one example is I created this um, bar graph in Excel, and then I did things like made the, I had to make the font bigger when I copied it over. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a second. Um, and I removed the grid lines, um, which is generally maybe not something you would do if you were submitting a paper maybe, but for our purposes, it just kind of clutters up the image. Um, this is something though you will wanna check with your faculty mentor about and just make sure that the elements that they think belong in your poster are there. But it's also a guideline I've seen in poster creation to try to simplify those visual elements so that they're easier to read. <laughs> 
Um, another common thing that tends to happen with visual elements is that we put in the visual element and then the font size is so tiny, you can't even see it, even if you're closer to it. So it does make it take up a lot more space in your poster to have the font size match the rest of your poster, but generally it's best practice to make sure the font is readable on the visual elements as well, even from far away, if you can. Um, but again, a lot of this depends on how much content you know you need to get into your poster, but just something to think about while you're designing it. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of different options for you to draw attention to an important aspect of a visual element. So I've created an arrow here, for example, to draw attention to like, hey, look, this is the largest amount of number of attendees by this profession in academia, it looks like, um, or highlighting, maybe not in this bright a color, but um, highlighting a number you particularly want people to take note of. Just some examples uh, of ways, if you have a lot of information to draw people to what's the most important element of that piece of information. So yes, just briefly, when you're copying information over from Excel, um, there can be a lot of options for pasting that information in. Um, when I've been looking at it, we generally want to go with the second option. So in Excel, you'll copy your the cells if it's a table, or you'll copy the chart or the graph that you have. Um, and then when you go into uh, PowerPoint to paste it, a lot of different options can come up to you. You can either paste it from the home button and then there's the paste option and then all these options come up. Or if you right click, all these options come up as well. So you can do it either way. Um, the same options will show up. Uh, generally what tends to be the best option based on my testing of this uh, is this second one, which is the keep the source formatting um, or it's the keep the source formatting and embed the workbook. Um, that way, all of the designing that you did with your element in Excel transfers over into your poster. You don't have to worry about reformatting as much. Um, generally, what has to happen after you've copied that element into your poster is you have to adjust the font sizes because um, that doesn't necessarily copy over the way you want it to. And then you have to change some formatting a little bit just to get it to look better on the poster. <laughs> Um, but that's how you get information from one from Excel into this, in this case, PowerPoint. Okay, so here's just another, uh, I have a couple of tips for you when you're going about creating your visual elements. Um, a lot of times it's charts, graphs, things like that. Um, maybe you have images that you've taken, um, depending on what field you're in, that you also want to include. Um, so these are just some tips I found for that. Generally, um, one idea is to create a separate file that's just your image repository. This helps you gather your images together, all the images you wanna use in one poster. Um, and then you can just pick and choose from them. You can format them within that without working in your actual poster file um, and determine whether that's the, uh, the quality is correct, all that kind of, all that good stuff um, before it's in your poster. So that's one idea. Um, the one that I used the most out of these tips was to zoom in to 100% on your poster after you've resized your poster. So it's at the full size you need it to be. Um, if you're working at it from far away, it's, it's going to look further away which is good because then we can see the whole poster at once. We can kind of see if the, all of the elements are readable, um, but to see what it's actually gonna look up up close, you scale into 100%. And then you can actually get a good idea of whether your visual element looks okay, <laughs> whether the quality is okay. Um, so that's one trick you can use just to check that kind of information. And then just the recommended file types for visual elements um, like pictures would be the PNG and the JPEG files. Generally, you're gonna to wanna to try and find, like let's say you're pulling from an outside free source, which there's a ton of them. We could talk about that um, if we need to, um, where you can find some stock images. Um, you'll want to look for larger, higher quality sizes. It's better to do it, it's better to download your images as a high quality, larger image, and then be able to scale it down because it's much harder to go the other way. The quality goes down the larger you make 
um, a smaller image. So just something to think about. Um, and if you need help with that kind of information, formatting your images, et cetera, um, that's gonna be something that's gonna be good for the innovation lab to help you with, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Oh, we'll talk about it now. Yeah, so if uh, we've covered some basic information here and I have a couple more things before um, we finish up today about finalizing and printing, but if you are running into any big issues with formatting your poster or you just want some help structuring it, I feel like structuring the content takes the longest amount of time um, or there's an image that's giving you a problem, you don't know how to resize it, or there's an application you're using that we didn't cover today, all of that stuff, um, the Innovation Lab is here to help you. So um, just generally the link, the Learning Innovation and Networking Center, we're located on the second floor of the library, in case you didn't know that already. Um, we offer a variety of services, um, including the IT and tech support, as well as the writing and researches and the CHAS tutoring, um, we're all located on the second floor. Um, but specifically for the IT and tech support, because I oversee the innovation lab, we can help you with um, anything related to your poster presentation in more detail. If we need to have a more one-on-one -on -one consultation with you, if you're having an issue um, that we didn't cover here. Um, in addition to a bunch of other tech support, whether that's the screen capturing, recording, 3D printing, tech tutoring, et cetera. Um, but we're up here on the second floor. And if you need help, we'd love to see you. So you can come on by. Uh, we generally can do walk-ins, but um, if there's an issue, I'll have my email address on the last slide, I think. So you can always just reach out to me and we can work on getting something scheduled too. So let's say we've got to the end. Uh, you've created your poster, your colors are good, your margins are good, your spacing is good. You like the way all the elements look and you think you're ready to print it. Um, the first thing you're gonna need to do is save it correctly. So it looks like we have two different file types we can save our uh, posters as, and that's either gonna be as a PowerPoint document or as a PDF. So depending on what uh, software application you're using is maybe depend, gonna depend on, uh, or is maybe gonna determine how you save your file. <laughs> PowerPoint is obviously already a PowerPoint, so that's not an issue. But let's say you're using something like the Adobe applications that you can use for posters, you wanna get that saved as a PDF, most likely. And then the next step is you need to make sure you get your poster approved by your faculty mentor. Um, that's a very important step because it won't get printed without that. Generally, the, the guide, guidance sounds like is that students aren't permitted to print in departments without their faculty mentors. So um, you want to make sure you take up your poster with your faculty mentor to get it approved and then work with them to get it printed for you once everything looks good to them. So here's some just key takeaways. <laughs> the most important ones that were mentioned to me are to make sure you size your poster slide before you add your content. That's gonna save you a lot of work um, if you do it at the beginning rather than at the end. Um, and just make, it'll help you make sure your elements are the correct size when you're working in it. Um, make sure you don't use a full color background or any large blocks of color on your poster. Uh, we talked about how we can add different color elements in there, but just make sure that it's not a full color background. Um, and then just make sure you get your poster approved for printing by your faculty mentor. Okay, where am I at? Okay. And like I said, feel free to visit the link for more ideas or if you need help creating your posters. Um, I know there's some posters on display in the life sciences building that you could take a look at for some more inspiration or ideas if you just need some, um, some inspiration. Um, but if you need help with any elements, we're happy to help you up here. And here's my email address. And I think I'm gonna pop it in the chat as well here for you guys, just so you have a reference. So if you need to reach out to me, if you need to create an appointment, for any help with any of this, I'm free for that. Um, I gave you the link to the LibGuide uh, on the library website. Um, and I think that's it from me. So I'll open it up to um, our attendees. Uh, if there's any questions you have, questions or concerns we can address here, we have a little bit of time we can devote to that.